uh, 45 minutes or so. It's, it's a real pleasure to welcome Bas Prinson to the A. Tell me, Bas, been to the building before? Never. Fantastic. I'm so <laughs> pleased to get him here, really. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll touch on this in a minute with my comments. But it's, um, Bas is here really uh, for a number of reasons, in addition to his considerable accomplishments, is I think one of the world's great photographers of things we think of as cities, urban settings, and architecture. Um, but he's here also, of course, from our own shared interest in the topic of architectural photography, particularly in recent years here at the AA. Um, in many unexpected ways, you could say what the 20th century taught us is that the dominating technologies of architecture weren't those everybody thought a hundred years ago, like steel and glass and all sorts of strange new things. It was actually the technology of the photograph and image making and image production that you could say has shaped architectural culture as we know it in ways unlike any other technology over the last hundred years. One of the things we've been doing at the A in recent years is re-examining the topic of the photographic image and image making as a part of architectural culture. Bass's visit follows on from, from exhibitions and symposia and lectures by um, other notable architectural photographers. I'm thinking of Iwan Ban's recent uh, exhibition next door and work that we did with him here, uh, Helene Binet and her retrospective a few years before that. And so this follows on and I think it's just the latest in what will continue to be a series of discussions around this topic of in a world dominated by the endless circulation of imagery, which for 50 years has been theorized by the reality that's placed within architectural and other cultures of what it means to craft, construct, and create such images that mm -hmm. go on to have the kind of influence they do amongst not just individuals interested in the photograph, but those individuals we think of as designers or architects. Um, and, and as I say, Bass is uh, absolutely an absolute acknowledged international master of that very topic, the crafting and construction of images and not just the, the final image itself. Um, uh, his lecture tonight, the photograph, uh, photo photography landscape and the image um, uh, and the visit tonight coincides with the installation work he's doing with the A exhibitions team across the hall in the gallery, an opportunity for us to bring his work to an audience here in the UK. Um, one of the, j just to say very briefly about that exhibition that opens Friday evening that you all, of course, are in invited to come in for, is that it's, it's an opportunity, and I think it's a first ever opportunity um, for us to, to talk not just about the images themselves and what they represent, but the process of creating a uh, very mm -hmm. unique process of creating those, which, which he's going to talk a little bit about tonight. Um, and again, to bring, to bring our attention towards the fact that the images as we know them and that circulate the way they do in the world are in fact constructed, made things. And that there is something like a craft, an art, and absolutely an intelligence associated with that that I think many architects and others might forget in the endless absorption of images around the world. And I think that's part of what we're trying to bring forward. Um, Bass's bio, and he comes to us this evening from Rotterdam, where he is based, and his studio mm -hmm. is there. Rotterdam is where I had first encountered uh, Bass at the Berlage Institute and had the honor and pleasure of sitting on his final jury as a student there, and was like the rest of the jury, knocked over completely by a portfolio of work that consisted of, of work that was setting the basis of a career that's unfolded over the last 10 years so staggering, with staggering accomplishments. He recently was the recipient of the Silver Lion Award at the Venice Biennale, working with his collaborators there on a project in, I think it was 2008? 10. Was it 10? I'm sorry, yeah, 2010. Um, uh, his work is extensively published, um, and again, the subject of critical discussion and debate um, within fields of photography and architecture, and it's an absolute and great pleasure to welcome Bass this evening here. Thank you Thank very you. much. So we keep it, we decided already to keep it uh, a little bit informal, so I will just talk, and talk is not my natural way of working. I work with images, that's, that's, that's what I'm daily doing, um, and I think it's nicer, I mean, I can have a whole lecture saying what things are about, but maybe it's nicer if you have a question. You just immediately ask, because then probably you will go deeper than what I would say at first. Um, I will show actually for the first time now um, 
something which, which I use to make my images. And that is actually, last year we made, with a couple of friends, the Oase magazine. It's a Dutch magazine on architecture. Uh, quite well, well known. And every time you have a different group of people making them. And this Oase was on models or on maquettes. And it's not only, uh, let's say, the, the small representation of something that's going to be built. But it's, it's mainly about the, uh, the way that you can put certain ideas within models. And then as a, as a little provocation, I showed uh, little booklets that I make, which I actually use for myself, which are basically these kind of little booklets. Very simple, A4, stupidly printed, full of references. And the references are ordered somehow. And the refer references are ordered not so much according to theme, but mainly uh, according to how an image looks, when it has a certain power. And then they are ordered in a way that they get more power when they get come next to each other. Um, and in a way, these are the uh, images that come before the images that I make. So I use them as a certain, you could say, as a, as a placeholder. Um, but I would like to start with this image, and I will skip quite a lot, but I will just jump straight into it. Um, one, one way of how I work is that at the moment when I made an image, when I made a photograph, when I've been somewhere and I photograph and I develop and I scan the image, and then I see it, I do a very quick test. Is it working, the image? And then when I think well, it's working, then I send it out to two, three friends. And I ask them, what do you, do you think it works? What do you see? Is there something extra? And um, at the moment when I send this, uh, actually Bart, Bart Lotzma, my former tutor, he sent me one minute later, he sent me this uh, image. <laughs> And I was really quite shocked. <laughs> <laughs> and I immediately looked on the internet, what does it mean? Because I know nothing about tarot. And, uh, and the first uh, hit on the internet, it says that wh uh, when you pull the card, the tower, it says when the tower is struck, one's understanding of reality will be altered or enter another di dimension. And I thought this was very powerful because this is exactly what I think that a photograph is able to do. When you make an image, you want somehow to transpose this, this reality that you have seen into something new, into something that has not been seen, which tells you something about either the future or about things that are about to happen. So that's, that's let's say, the start. And by the way, it is an image in which it's called the Future Highway, which gives you a little bit of a hint of what's going on. It's, um, it's in China, it, it's in a city called Xiamen, uh, which is in the southeast of uh, China. And it's, um, it's a so-called village in the city. It's uh, farmers, former farmers who built illegally houses to house the population that is building the cities. And in order to somehow undermine their way of making a city, infrastructure is being planned through them. So there is this story behind it, how, how they uh, come, come about. But on the other hand, I'm very interested in this rhythm of the blocks in the way how the white block is the one which is the most perfect and that's the one which is being dis destroyed. In a way, the story behind the picture is, is not always the most important for me. It has to really be visually powerful and it has to be able to it should be able to incorporate more than one uh, reading. I will talk uh, maybe about two books today. One is called uh, Refuge. Uh, that's the official title, but I call it uh, Five Cities Portfolio. Uh, it looks like this. And the other one is called Reservoir, which is the newest book, um, which looks like this. It's, uh, they are both here, so if you later want to look at them. So it's, it's a kind of a square format. Um, and I will show you the, 
the reference books. And the reference books I will show, and it's uh, maybe a bit, well, we will, we will go through it, but the reference book, as I said, was something that it actually came about when I had to do the assignment for the five cities, which is this book. It's a bit of a strange cover, but that was given. Um, and it was an assignment for the, for the architectural biennial in Rotterdam. And there was a big research on five cities being, being done. And they asked me to combine these five cities and to somehow tell a story um, which the individual authors could not tell. Um, and since I had never been in any of these cities, it was uh, uh, Istanbul, Cairo, Dubai, Beirut, and Amman. I had never been in any of those, and I had about eight days in each city. So I had to develop a certain strategy. How can I go there and do what I normally do and not fall in the trap of, of showing these cities as, you know, this is Cairo, this is Amman, this is not what I'm interested in. And uh, as a, at that point, I, I thought, well, if I take a couple of references to start with, and I take the idea that I shouldn't photograph five cities, but I should photograph one city. And those two um, thoughts together m made me quickly make this little book, and we will go through it quickly. So it's a very associative uh, way of putting images together. Some are from those cities, some are from architectural history, some are found on the internet. They're all found on the internet, actually. Um, and somehow they, they, they do something together when they come, when they are com combined. There always needs to be some kind of utopia in it, otherwise you cannot work, I find. So here we see uh, Star Trek connected to Dubai. And then you have Mecca and Cairo. And they seem somehow un unrelated, but when you will see the, the images that I made, there might be some, um, let's say, interplay going on. So here we start. This is Cairo. It's an uh, informal settlement quite close to Giza. And already, if you remember the first picture of the book, there is a certain relation. This is Dubai. This is the, the workers' camps. Cairo again. Dubai again, Cairo, but actually you don't even have to say because you understand that somehow there is a, there is a, a, a type of city that is, that is coming up and, and this type of city is not in the center, it's on the periphery. Um, so the way I work, I go to the periphery, I, I ask one or two local architects or, or city planners, we sit together on the map for one day we talk about where the city is expanding, where it's hitting natural borders, where it's um, uh, uh, where the division of wealth is. And then I go to these places and I choose one. And on that one place, which is quite a small area, I would work for the rest of the time that I'm uh, in that city. In Istanbul. Hmm. 
it's um, the question was actually to to relate them to the idea of refuge, and and this is a very strange uh, way to. It's 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 maybe a bit tricky to explain in that way, but you could say that there is there are similar ways of how a space is being made when you exclude yourself, so in a gated community, or when you're being excluded. And in a way, I in all these five cities, I was looking for the not for these extremes, but for all the devices that, let's say, all the architecture uses to somehow put itself apart from the city. So in a way, here you could say that in this picture, it's almost like an old fortress. You know? It's like you, you, you build up and build up and build up, and you don't need a fence anymore. You, it's, um, so it were all these shades of gray that it's it's not very clear that it's a gated community or a refugee camp because those two I, I think are too extreme and they are interesting to know but I think these two extremes have a lot of influence of on how you how the city develops by itself you know? because you take devices from the one and you take a device from the other and then it becomes a normal uh, type of of building. No? This is, for instance, a, a long-stay hotel in Dubai. <coughs> Sorry. But I don't know if you remember that. Um, maybe I can go quickly back. So if we take in account, for instance, these two, the Black Cube, which is, the, which is a cooling plant in Dubai. It's a building to make, to cool water, just to cool water, that's it. And it's being built by Pakistani workers, which are in the front. And obviously, this image wants to also tell something else. Uh, it wants to be another symbol. But when you're there, it's not so clear. No? And this one is um, its a former sugarcane field. It's the first building of the city that is going to come very, very rapidly. So they already anticipate the city. They anticipate it in height, so they know that in two years all these fields will be full with towers. So they built as high as possible. They already built the blind wall because they know there will be a building next to it. And at the same time, at this moment, it's really kind of a Ur, Ur monument by, by this uh, standard. No? Sorry, that's going back to that one. The, the image <coughs> that you showed me when we were looking at the work is the poster from 2001. Yes. Which is also that image is a kind of a monument with some weird kind of marker, isn't it, of something to come, yes. something that's been. Is there, in your references, is there kind of a meaning reference as well as a physical? Well, the funny thing is that I always think that they're just, just images, and then when I go a bit deeper, then there's many more layers that, that, that I didn't put in at first, not consciously at least. Yeah. Um, but we can we can quickly go to to them and then you because for instance the right picture I didn't even know until I made the the picture of the of the cooling plant so the black cube that it's a, that it's quite similar and it's even uh, made in a similar type of landscape and you see these people in the front mm -hmm. standing they have a, they give the scale to the object the object is uh, is a kind of well it's 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 basically there, but it's not clear what it's what it's used for. It has a, should have a meaning, but it's, that's not very clear. And then here, of course, these are well. This is the link between the. the it's also in the end why in the book they are next to each other, mm -hmm. because in the reference book they they had a connection. And while making the pictures, I already knew that they might come very close. So I so I made the picture in a way that they could always be next to each other, so they have the same distance. And this is, of yeah, it's of course Mecca, but I was quite surprised how Mecca looks at this point. It looks almost like Dubai, you know? You don't see the, 
the Kaaba at all from this uh, point. The city is much bigger. And then the right picture is I made in, it's a snapshot which I made in, in the Nile Valley in Egypt, that when you visited the Kaaba, you're, ab you're allowed to paint it on your house. Uh, and that is, I, I somehow like this, all this, all these elements that, that come together and these worlds and these cities that, su that are connected. And then the images that are coming out of it that, that you can add to this understanding of this object. No? So I will go forward. So you, uh, oh, I'm going backwards, sorry. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but I must also admit that I like very much to have a landscape part of the image. I, uh, um, there should always be a relation between the, between the ground and the object. And this relation can be very harsh. Or even in this case, you can say it's very harsh, but still there is a certain... It's a total <laughs> It's a total invasion. <laughs> Yes, and there is something funny in, in all these five cities. The the buildings are there before the infrastructure, and this is something which yeah. which, for instance, in Europe we don't do. No? We yeah, yeah. we first make the infrastructure, and then we make the buildings. But there, they always make the building first, and the infrastructure comes after. And one person was telling me that this comes from from the idea of the of the gated com com community, because if you live in a gated community, you have anyway a four by four, and you can come there without any problem. They even prefer to not have, in certain areas, they prefer to not have a, a proper infrastructure coming to their, to their uh, area. No? And this is a, gar this, it's called garbage city. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's that's, that's how people call it. Um, it's a place in Cairo where 80,000 people live, where they recycle all the garbage of, uh, of uh, Cairo. Mm. And, um, Can I ask you something? Yes. Before Brent was uh, about, uh, talking about the, the technology, let's say, between, between photography, and I was wondering what your kind of, let's say, more technical uh, sort of tricks uh, to also produce these images that uh, say on, on the surface it always is kind of like objective or simple, but yes. I was wondering if but it's, it's, it's actually a very good question and also on, on this picture it's a very good question because um, it's, it's made with a large format but it's, uh, I think that is not the main uh, that's not the interesting thing um, the only thing in interesting about the large format is that it has a kind of a measuring device so you see on the back of the camera you see the image turned upside down and you see a grid in front of it so, so you are very conscious that you are somehow measuring something or you're measuring the world or the reality or um, so that influences you quite a bit but for, for instance this one is I couldn't make it with my <coughs> with my normal lens so I had to do it in two so it's two uh, it's it's two negatives the place is actually exactly like like this and therefore it gets also a little bit a strange perspective which I which I kind of which I like somehow and then um, I work very closely with uh, um, with one person who does the the image uh, the post post production let's say and we have a, a lot of um, discussions about how the image should look and where your eye should enter and where your eye should travel and how your eye should travel and uh, how you enter and exit the picture. It's maybe a bit a technical way, but uh, <coughs> I, can <coughs> I can explain you maybe a bit. Um, uh, in the real, the real image was a bit more flat. Yeah, thank you. And very early on I decided that 
actually this part was was almost uh, you would not go there with your with your eye so we decided that it would be interesting if you would enter the picture as it, well your eye would enter the picture somewhere here and then you would somehow slowly travel like this and you go around and somehow you do that no you keep and then you keep uh, your caught somehow so this place had to stay black therefore had to be dark actually this uh, exactly this white spot is exactly in the middle this in this black cube it's something that you don't really see but it it helps you how how to organize the image no? how your brain organizes the image so we let's say we 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 use only darker and light so we make things a little bit lighter a little bit darker so we make for instance this area a little bit darker we make this a little bit lighter so you're more easily guided towards this view and then here we had to make it also a little bit darker so you wouldn't uh, fly away yeah it, I cannot say it in another way you wouldn't do this no you want to do that so in it maybe that's a that's a small on, and and actually every picture has a certain trick like like this or you can call it trick but I call it how you build up the image how you make it how you make sure that what you want to tell is that well that you're able to see it no? You 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 keep the viewer <laughs> <laughs> somehow. Do the reference books help you with setting up that strategy for the image, or is that very much the post production? That's that's very much trial and error. Sometimes yeah. um, when a, when a, well the the images in the reference book are there because the images work. You know they yeah, are yeah, yeah. they yeah. they work very well. So you look at them and immediately you're you're either caught. You know so and then sometimes when we don't figure out how to do it we have certain references where we can come back to and then we say ah but maybe we should try to make it much darker maybe we should uh, 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 maybe the type of light is not right and then we can do small alterations but it's only small I mean, the, the reality is the reality is like like this and then you somehow build up the image afterwards it's a layer on top And there's always a certain idea behind every picture. There's has, it has to be a singular idea somehow. And this, of course, is the idea that somehow the city is almost rolled out over a perfect green meadow. Mm -hmm. As if you have a carpet of city that you, can, you can roll out. And somehow that only happens when you're there. I understand that because the buildings have almost the same type of color as the sand that that type that that idea could work The, the story is always it's always behind somehow it's not it's, it's never I would never choose an image just for the story if, if the image is not doing it by itself then it's then it's not enough and a lot of times when you go somewhere because of a reason that there that it's let's say interesting in a social way then it's very hard to find the image that tells that story you somehow have to disconnect it in order to be able to see things. Huh? If you want to put too many things in one image, uh, somehow it gets obscured. Huh? You, have to, you have to keep cutting things out. <laughs> and that's also within the reality when you're, you have to cut, cut and cut. You have to really focus very much with your camera. You have to keep out all kind of things that might tell another story 
because you want to have this one at least I want I, I want to have this one type of uh, uh, well one type of story and then you can put these stories next to each other and they will tell something more no? so you say cutting bass because there's a lot of kind of architectural cross sections it's like you're slicing through images as well in buildings mm -hmm. there seems like lots of sort of the buildings that seem abruptly to end sometimes the landscape begins like you've already kind of sliced them mm -hmm. which is really makes them very striking it's yes. like you kind of not only set up the image you've sliced through buildings Yes, but this is something that the camera somehow can do, and, and you have to be very aware that when you, when you're in an empty landscape and there is one object, and you cut out the empty landscape, mm -hmm. you know you have a possibility to play with this idea, you know, with this, with this idea that, it, that you might think that there are more of these objects that you, could imagine that this type of development goes on. So I, I see much more than I should see normally. Because I, and, and that's also when I s look through the camera, then I actually see what, what is possible. When I'm just looking in the landscape, it's, 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 it's more tough, it's more difficult to find it. Do you wonder, is it a... Yeah, yeah. It's like the camera becomes an instrument as well. Yeah, totally, exciting. totally. I, uh, once someone asked me um, in, a, in a lecture, so but but when are you very excited when you take a picture? And I say, well, when I'm under the black cloth and I see something and I take away the black cloth and I look to the thing that I'm photographing and these two things have nothing to do with each other. They're completely different. Huh? That's the moment when I get very excited. <laughs> So here they are just hanging in exhibitions. And it's, uh, um, I wanted to introduce, but maybe I will do it very quickly. Be because of this idea with, with the reference, um, I wanted to introduce this old work, well, old work from 81, Park City by Louis Baltz, who, who I find very interesting. For for many for for many reasons, but it's a work which he made. He, he's a photographer artist um, uh, from the new topographics, or at least that's where he's put. Um, and he photographed for a while. In this case, he photographed uh, Park City, which is a second houses estate in the Aspen Mountains, and he photographed it in a very objective but still a quite bizarre way. Somehow he's also explaining that he's photographing there because there is, a, he called it a, a symptom, symptomatic uh, place of our society in, in 81. So it's this kind of space that doesn't seem to be finished and that is just second houses and about money and about leisure. At the same time he said, ah, but that's actually not the most important reason why I'm there. The most important reason why I'm there is that it's because it's really, really high up and I'm a photographer and I want things to be as flat and sharp as possible, so I have to be high up to get all the detail. And these two things together make, uh, make it very interesting. Then at the same time, he, he doesn't really talk about it, but he uses almost, you could say, almost an aesthetic of war photography in this, uh, in this, in this landscape. So you have this... I mean, this kind of a strange where you have no clue whether or not they're building something, destroying something, whether it's going well or whether or it's going bad. And I think this, this ambiguity is a very interesting state that you can, you, can, you can reach through cutting things out of reality. And then he basically slowly moves into the houses which actually keep the same strangeness. Oh. Um, there should be, sorry. Because I wanted to just show you a little clip of Fata Morgana, which is the, 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 the movie by Werner Herzog. Um, because oh. 
Im Paradies versetzen auch ungläubige Berge. Dort werden Kriege schon von Müttern verhindert. No, because Louis Baltz uh, said that Raya he could links. only photograph this park city Im and he knew how to do it Glück. after he saw this movie by Werner Herzog. No, so it's a, Im schon I like this idea that you build on top of a view of someone else and you add something, you, you update Dort it. Ist die Landschaft, you wie Gott sie hat. Well, here you, and, and this is, let's say, the most, almost the most evident uh, part of this uh, movie where you see the relation well, quite, quite clearly somehow. And Herzog says that he went out to, photo, to, to film a, 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 a science, science fiction movie, but that he failed somehow. And you know she's half crazy, but that's why well, I, I will you keep it quite short. Eat it. And she feeds you tea and oranges that come all the way from China, and just when you mean to tell her that you have no love to give her, then she gets you on her way. And she lets the river answer that you've always been her lover. And you want to travel okay, with it. her. And you want to travel blind. And you know that to, she will trust you. For you touched her perfect body. <laughs> so my But it was somehow uh, those two references that 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 uh, that made me work on a new series, which in the end was published as a book, uh, Reservoir. And this is the main image of this uh, book. This is the image called Reservoir. It's a uh, it's a uh, in the San Gabriel Mountains in Los Angeles. I traced back the 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 water or the idea of water, because the relation of water and LA is a very, very, very strange relation. And I understood that if you go out, trace it back, that you might find extraordinary elements or a uh, uh, relation towards the landscape that, is, that might be interesting. No? Um, so the book looks like, looks like this. It starts with a reference. It's the reference which is on the second reference book. It's a, it's a picture by Asherhel Curtis from 1911. Uh, it's called the, the, the Leveling of the Hills to Make Seattle. We will come back to it in a minute. And then the book looks like this. But I will jump now to the real pictures. And actually, I will just go through it. I mean, I, I can explain them, but I think it's nicer if we just see the order somehow, if we kind of go through it.
So here I will do it the other way around. Now I will show the reference book. Maybe <laughs> there are some things that you will somehow find back. No? And we start with this image that I told you is the, is the, it's called the leveling of the hills to make Seattle. That was the, the image that somehow explains all the pictures. And what you actually see is the building of Seattle in, at the moment when the frontier was kind of over and they started to build industrial cities. Uh, and these mountains that you see are leftover pieces of land that are not yet sold. So they were not allowed to uh, dig the sand away. So it's a, a reverse process of, uh, of what you would somehow imagine. No? left is uh, Bamako in Mali after the French came. And right is some phosphor uh, element. Left is a, is a, is a reference by uh, Schuyter and Peters, which are cartoon, well, you could, they're, they're not really cartoonists, but they make a very beautiful series of cartoons in which they call it the, the, in, the invisible uh, frontier. And right is the building of Le Poème Electronique, the building of uh, Le Corbusier in uh, Brussels uh, uh, World Exhibition. And it's a double curved uh, building and they couldn't build it yet at that point. There were no computers, there were uh, no way to make this. Uh, and actually Philips gave them a hall, hallway, which they filled with sand. They made the layers, uh, they cut the building in, in sections and they shaped the sand in, in the way how the building should be and then they casted the concrete on top, the pieces of the, and then the pieces were moved to, to Brussels. And somehow these two have, they have something in common. And uh, <coughs> left, left is a satellite image of a, half pipe of a snow snowboard half pipe, that one. Right is in India, very beautiful objects to measure the universe. Mm -hmm. Le Corbusier. A landing site for a Zeppelin and a Buckminster Fuller. Then left is a is a way to build up TNT to make the biggest hole possible. And right is, a, is one of the biggest holes in the world. It's a mine. The covering of uh, glaciers on the left and an early piece by Serra on the right. The Super Studio is never far away. And then the extremely beautiful shadow of a, of a zeppelin on top of the on the Nile Valley, and right is the artist uh, uh, called Sigi Gudmundsson. Robert Smithson left, and um, and a glacier on the right, and then we're actually back to the image that we started with. But something happened to this image, and I think I have it bigger. Ah, here is the bigger version. Um, this is, two museums have this image. They all say they have the original. They both say they have the original. This is the one museum saying this is the original. This is the second museum saying this is the original. <coughs> Besides that it's mirrored, it also is completely different in the sky. It, it, and somehow already you see what I was talking about that you enter the image in a completely different way with your, with your eyes. No? Mm -hmm. And when I saw this, uh, this, this fact that you can actually do this, I had a lot less trouble to do this with my own work. So now maybe 20% of my images I, I, I mirror because somehow they, it's easier to get in then or it's better to, it works better. And, so, and it's strange that somehow you always have to find a, a reason to do this, no? to allow yourself to do this. 
So I was very happy to find it. <laughs> and then I can quickly show you, because for instance, I don't always know, but somehow when you see these two together, these two together, so these four together, and you see then the image which I made in China, it's called uh, um, um, uh, Future Olympic Park. It's uh, in the middle of Beijing, the place where they are building the, the, the Olympic Park. And something similar happens with the scale that is, that is happening on the left, that is happening on the right. And I like that a reference is never one, it's never a one-to-one -one copy to a picture. It's always five references together make one new picture. And the reference can continue. And my picture can be together with the reference and then it becomes a new picture somehow. So it's a kind of continuously working with the images that you store in your, in your mind, no? in, your, in your brain, they somehow become yours and you can use them and you have to use them and I somehow I call it that I have to update the images that I already have or I, I collected and in that way you could also say that this image of Ashel Curtis of 1911 I think this is an updated version of that one it's a bit of both I, I, I have uh, a certain amount that I really like. There is something in it that I'm fascinated by, but I cannot always tell what it is. And then when I see the, the thing in reality, I, I know what part, and I also know which, which reference image it is, normally. And you could even say that even this one, it comes from the same reference images. No? You have these four, and this one comes from that, from those four reference images, but this one also clearly comes from those four. And then if you take these four, you somehow come to this, huh? or in my mind, you come to this. <laughs> and the Le Corbusier is of course easy, <laughs> it's an it's a easy one. And these, I, I, I don't always know them because, for instance, this one, I didn't know that I had a reference image for it. But in one of my folders that has not more than 100 images, um, the, right, the left one was, was in there. And somehow now I find that it has a good connection. Yes. No, the book is very important because in the book you can, well, what I was just explaining is that you make all these cutouts of reality, but out of these cutouts you have to still make sense that they somehow tell something together. Yeah. And the book is the only, the only way that you can do it, because yeah. in exhibitions it's normally not enough pictures, not enough, you cannot do enough mm -hmm. somehow, yeah, or you need to be in a really big place or you need to print them small, but that, that I don't like. Um, so the so the book is the perfect place, and it's also it has you have so much attention when you're in a book, and you can go left and right, which I like a lot. I'm not someone who goes one way. I even normally start in the middle. So the books that I make, you can do that. No? You can you don't need the story. The story doesn't start on picture number one. Yeah. You can enter in the middle and then go to the left or go to the right, and the story will somehow unfold. And even in this uh, refuge one, it's, it's completely mirrored because it had to be also in Arabic. So this was a very uh, stupid idea, but you know, it, it's, it works as perfectly from left to right as from light, right to left. And I think that a lot of these abstractions somehow help me to, to make the images also. So it's not only the way that they're ordered, but also I always tell myself that there has to be a certain abstraction in the image 
in order to allow these type of things. It's, um, how are we doing with time? Is it, uh, is it fine? It doesn't always only work with reference images. It also works with images itself. So for instance, these three images that I will show you now, they, they were made in one week after each other. This was the first one. It's, it's all in China. Uh, uh, I don't even know what it is, but uh, there is something that I, the scalelessness, the, kind of the, the misunderstanding if it's natural or not. Then a few days later, I made this one. And I, I didn't think there was any connection between the two obviously, but the day after I made this one, I made this one. <laughs> and I honestly think that I could have never seen this last one if I wouldn't have made the first two the days before. And I think that's a very clear way to explain how, how this works. This making of an image is always a set of ideas that come together. And you somehow can see it in the reality because you know you can cut it out. I don't know what comes after this. Ah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's maybe a strange jump, but to me, if you combine this, these crystals, the continuous monument, the, v the very bizarre shadow of the, of the Zeppelin, you come to the to the one which is made in LA, it's called Superior Court. And if I have to explain this image to someone, I always say, it's, to me, it is as if I found a piece of the continuous monument built, built in reality, even almost as, if, as how they would have meant it. And it only happened when I uh, looked through the camera, and the camera by accident was on the wrong um, lens, and the building was cropped off from the top. And at the moment when the building was cropped off in the top, it disappeared. And it, this was something I saw on my camera and not in reality. And as I say, you know, it's always about this mirroring and about doubling and about... Um, so one week later I was in Houston and I... Oh, there's text. It's not supposed to be there. but. Um, um, then I made this this photograph, which is in everything the reverse of this. It's a it's a it's a building that is not there somehow. It's the eternal uh, fight of most architects. That or well, for a, for a while there was an idea that you could make buildings that were not there, and I thought I had to do it if I wanted to have the building disappear, it should disappear as much as possible and it had to be gold. And um, it disappears for another technical, well, not a technical reason, but uh, I, I, I was walking around very, very long to find a place where everything looked very perfect, where the horizon was perfectly in line with this, uh, uh, with this building. And there is a building here which is reflected in the facade. And it took me a long time to find the exact position so it would continue the highway. And that actually is the point of the picture that makes it, that makes it work, that makes that it disappears somehow. I had it for a while. It makes it transparent. I had it for a, for a while in my studio and then at, after after a few days, you don't see the building anymore. You just see the horizon. Oh. Well, the Smithson, it's, it's, um, it's somehow clear. And then when you would combine, again, you take three pictures. This one, this one, which is also a reservoir in Los Angeles. And this one, which is a, which are sections of the landscape in Holland, you get to a new picture, which is which is uh, which I made after the three f one prior to this one, and this is in China. And if you go back now, you can see the 
the, f the formal arrangements, but somehow also you understand that that this kind of act of building is, is similar everywhere, no? this kind of act of how we deal with the landscape. In some places it's a bit more archaic, but, but the way we are treating this landscape is, we are, we are, we are quite, we are doing the same somehow everywhere. And I like, I like to expose that, or I like to use that. So I think we, we should keep it there. We should keep it here, I think. Or if there are more questions. No, I, n I recently moved. <laughs> I re recently moved to to very high end digital, but this is not is not so interesting. It it makes a little bit uh, difference because you see the camera is different, so you see different. You you have to relearn uh, to to see the things that I saw quite easily on the big screen because now the screen is smaller. I suspect that the images will become a bit more abstract because the detail disappears. But this is also a conscious choice because I, I thought I'd worked long enough with this big camera. Now I, I'm ready. I finished the book. Now I want to push myself to enter a new, well, a new series, wi which you somehow also can do by, by changing your 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 working method. No? Yes, very. <laughs> yeah, but the digital, the digital camera that I have is basically a digital element that you click on the back of a, of a uh, camera that looks pretty analog. It still has to be on a tripod and it's uh, you cannot make many pictures, and it's this. What this I did quite deliberately because I didn't want to have the. I also have a, you know, this. I call it my snapshot camera, but it's. Uh, I, I I. There's never been any picture that sur sur survived out of that camera. Normally, I also prefer to sit there. <laughs> <I'd Yeah. say. laughs> Yeah, but actually, I mean, this is something. I wonder if you talk about interiority versus exteriority and the kind of ambiguity of those two terms that, that your images seem to yeah. pull out. Yeah, and you, and you so start to just. The conventional definition you start on a good image now, and it's because. Uh, oh. uh, th this was an image where I understood that there could be also maybe a landscape within a room, and then. Then I started to understand that this is actually quite interesting uh, idea, and then recently I made this one, which is, uh, yeah, it's it's almost the landscape as a room, or it's 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 not clear anymore what it what it is, and I, um, I think it's it's never really about interior or exterior, but there should be a a certain idea of landscape involved. 
and then it can still be and then it can still be inside no it can be can be quite con con confined space so that i have the feeling i need the the i need to keep on working on this idea of landscape that is even though the first pictures have it only seems like it's buildings but there the, to me the relation between the landscape and the building is is always the most the most important so the the way how those two interact and then they become more and more more and more ambiguous because i think even behind this yeah um behind this there is even a landscape which becomes almost almost an interior because i start to cut off the top now and i start to understand that if you make the top very heavy of the picture so quite dark if people take this picture if i give them the picture they always turn it around first they want to have the white they want to have the white above um so now i'm starting on a series of pictures where the top is very heavy and maybe that is that makes it even more more interiorized somehow it makes it even more scary to understand that it's an actual landscape so but uh yeah it's it's a more formal answer <laughs> it's a more it's an answer more on a kind of a formal level but but i it it gives a lot of opportunities to be so close somehow and to tell something about a space that you understand that is much 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 bigger Thank you.